the Sumerian people once inhabited the region near the Persian Gulf known as Iraq. Greeks called this country Mesopotamia, which means the land between the rivers, as the Euphrates and Tigris, rising in Anatolia, flowed through Syria and Iraq before discharging into the Persian Gulf. Simurum is the name given to the northern region by the Semitic peoples later, like the word Sumerian, which was later used for the southern region. According to the Sumerians, their land was called Kiengi, or Land of the Lord, En. Sometime after 4000 BC, the Sumerians moved to this coastal area, but it's unclear from where they came. There is no connection between their language and any other language spoken in the region. After sailing upriver from the Persian Gulf, they migrated inland from the coastal area. On the other hand, Sumerians came from the northeast of Mesopotamia and traveled down the river to the south. Simurum would indicate that the Sumerians once lived in the northern region. The Sumerians must have encountered people who had already settled in the Persian Gulf area for a long time when they entered, since a few cities had names that did not match Sumerians, but were most likely derived from an unknown language. Examples include Uruk, Esnuna and Shurupak. Similarly, Buranuna, the name of the Euphrates River, makes no sense in Sumerian, whereas Idigna, the name of the Tigris River, might be explained as the Blue River. Farmers had established small settlements along these two great rivers during the 5th millennium BC. To irrigate agricultural crops, they diverted water from rivers through canals. There was little rainfall in this area, and the sun burned mercilessly during the summer months, so everyone lived entirely off flood water from the rivers. The rivers could be dangerous, though, as the land was flat, and there was always the danger that the river would overflow its banks and change its course, inundating new areas and destroying crops and water supplies. The great rivers carried silt through the plain, forming swamps along the Persian coast. Here, the inhabitants grew cane for making little reed houses for the gods. God Enki was responsible for this domain. He brought civilization to the Sumerians and lived underground in a freshwater residence, the Abzu, located below the Earth's surface but above the ocean's saltwater expanse. Enki's main temple was built in Eridu, a settlement much closer to the coast. Archaeologists discovered a prehistoric temple and dozens of fish remains, indicating that fish offerings were made to this temple's deity. During the 2nd millennium BC, the Sumerian king lists recorded Eridu as the oldest inhabited city in the world. A mythical record of the ancestors of the Sumerian deities is included here, followed by historical kings confirmed by other sources. Various Sumerian towns exercised kingship for a time after the throne descended from heaven. The king list reports that a flood came over the land after Eridu, and various places were assigned the kingship successively, such as Sipar and Shurupak. There is also a connection between this story and the flood story found in Genesis 6, 6-8. As people misbehaved, God decided to wipe them out, and only Noah, a man who had lived righteously, was spared. Noah was given precise instructions on how to build a big ship, an ark, from gopher wood and pitch. As per Sumerian mythology, Enlil, not Yahweh, decided to destroy his people, while Enki saved a righteous man and life on earth by taking the initiative. To save himself, his family and all the animals, Enki warned Ziusudra, the king of Shurupak, to build a ship. For six days and seven nights, this vessel endured a terrible storm. Deluges and windstorms continued, leveling the land. Like a woman in labor, the windstorm and deluge ended their struggle on the seventh day. The storm stilled in seven days as the sea calmed and the deluge ceased. Ziusudra released a dove, but it returned to the boat after finding nowhere to land. Ziusudra released a swallow after some time, but the bird returned, and he released a raven after some time. As the waters ebbed, the raven flew off. 
After eating, preening, and leaving droppings, it did not turn around. Survivors realized that land had been exposed once the water subsided. Thanking their gods for their survival, they left the ship. Ziyasudra was rewarded with eternal life by the gods for his outstanding merits. Uruk then exercised its kingship, and the king list records the names of its rulers, including the legendary Gilgamesh. According to the king's list, the kingship spread to twenty other cities after the flood, the first being Kish in the northern region. The first actual city of history began as a small settlement near the Euphrates River, near the Persian Gulf. There were a minimum of 20,000 people living in Uruk by about 3,600 BC, and a considerable rampart protected the city. 1. The City of Uruk Among all the city names, Uruk endures the longest, having been preserved until today as Iraq. The current Iraqi name for Uruk is Waka, related to the antique name Uruk. Uruk's inhabitants had built a new rampart around 3400 BC with a circumference of 9.5 kilometers and an inner wall of 5 meters thick and an outer wall with pinnacles and observation posts. Agriculture and horticulture were presumably carried out within the city's walls. In myth, Gilgamesh built this city and its citizens were proud of it. According to Gilgamesh's epos, Uruk's growth resulted from a vast trading network. There is evidence of Uruk culture on cylinder seals, measuring jugs and architecture, which suggests that the inhabitants played a significant role. In the north, they travelled to Anatolia, today's Turkey. In the east, they founded the city of Susa. In the west, they reached Egypt via the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. The Urukians came to the north of Mesopotamia to participate in the trade in copper and silver, which had its center in Anatolia with its abundant copper and silver mines. A coppersmith's workshop was discovered in Uruk, along with ceramics from northern Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and Transcaucasia. Archaeologists attribute this Uruk expansion to the fact that they followed well-established trade routes along which donkey caravans carried commodities, copper, silver, and precious stones. Their tools, knowledge of production processes, architecture, eating habits, and gods were taken by the Urukians. In some regions, they formed enclaves amid autochthonous people. In other regions, they settled in areas with no population. The Uruk colonists built a substantial settlement with dead straight roads surrounded by a solid wall around 3200 BC. Archaeologists from the Netherlands have excavated a substantial settlement of the Uruk expansion, Habuba Kabira, upstream of the Euphrates. This region was likely chosen because it was advantageous for sheep farming and was situated in an area with sufficient rainfall to support agriculture without irrigation. Sheep and goats could be pastured in open fields, and flax could have been grown by immigrants. In Uruk, wool and fibers were highly sought after because the textile industry was a primary source of employment, which required large quantities of sheep's wool and flax. It lasted about 200 years, but around 3200 BC, the expansion abruptly ended for unknown reasons. Some places were abandoned altogether, such as Habuba Kabira. However, in other regions, like Subatu in northern Mesopotamia, the Urukians were absorbed by the native peoples or went their own way. Egypt and Mesopotamia lost contact, and the Elamites seized Susa in the east. There was a divergent development in northern Mesopotamia due to its isolation from the rest of the region. There had been a breakdown in the trade connection. Northern Mesopotamia's expansion may have ended with the arrival of Semitic nomads who penetrated the plain from the north and drove a wedge between the north and south. Despite this, the city of Uruk thrived as never before after the end of the Uruk expansion. Uruk shifted the trade routes to the Persian Gulf to maintain trade routes once the north's contacts were broken. Due to this seaway, Merchants became familiar with the civilization developed along the Indus River, 
enabling India to prosper. Indus civilization might be called Meluha, according to the written sources. As the script of the Indus region has yet to be deciphered, it is unclear how relations with this faraway land developed. Meluha was the name of a little town in southern Mesopotamia during the third millennium. This colony could have been established by merchants of the Indus culture, since there is also a cylinder seal from Ur which was once owned by a Meluha interpreter. See chapter 8, figure 8.3. We see pictures of typical Indian water buffaloes on these cylinder seals, an animal that had been imported from India to Mesopotamia somehow. The water buffalo featured prominently on cylinder seals during the reign of King Sargon of Akkad, 2334 to 2279 BC, and the king boasted that Maluha-bound ships moored at Akkad Keys. Uruk's Temples Uruk was initially divided into two districts. There was a sanctuary of the God of Heaven, An, in the western district of Kulab, According to legend, he was an old native god who built his temple on a terrace 11 meters high. Due to its gypsum plaster walls, archaeologists refer to it as the White Temple. A star was used to write his name in Sumerian, a general sign of divinity such as God of Heaven. There must have been a temple to Inanna, a complex of substantial freestanding buildings in the eastern district of Uruk which the written texts refer to as Eana or Eana, literally House of Heaven. However, details are sparse. It is estimated that Temple D measured no less than 80 by 50 meters by the time it was built around 3400 BC. Mosaic Court or Pillar Temple was the entrance to this building. It was probably not a temple but a prestigious inner court with a peristyle leading to the rest of the sacred precinct. This building was called Mosaic Court by the diggers because it was decorated with geometric figures made of baked cones inserted into the walls. As with the previous building, this one had enormous dimensions, measuring 50 by 22 meters. Cuneiform tablets dating back to 3400 BC have been found in Temple C. The tablets detail specific goods delivered, indicating a thriving economy. The excavators have named the buildings on the Ayana complex temples, but some scholars have doubts about this designation. They suggest that these massive buildings were competing families' business houses and workshops. The so-called altars would more likely have been podia on which the local sheikhs received the petitions of their clientele or on which they presided during meetings with the local elite. However, this may be too biased a picture when one considers the realities of that time. As we will learn in Chapter 4, secular and religious activities were utterly entangled. Rulers acted under the gods' protection. Having one activity without the other was almost impossible. They appointed priests responsible for the temple's daily affairs and handled their business as if the temples were palaces with a god as the supreme head. Eana's mistress was Inanna. The myths describe her living in the Gipa, where the statue of the city god was located and where the high priest or high priestess and the temple staff lived. There were kitchens, sleeping rooms, and workshops in the Gipa, but we needed help finding Uruk Inanna's Gipa. In addition, it is still determined where she was worshipped. Many rosettes were found here, a unique symbol associated with Inanna, possibly at the Red Temple. The myth praises the Lord of Arata, Enmerka, and Eana of Uruk. A version of this myth dates to around 2000 BC and preserves memories of the great Inanna complex. In brick-built Kulab, Inanna's holy Gipa shone like silver in a load like Unug Kulab's Eana. Over the fourth millennium, Uruk's administrative tools became increasingly inadequate despite its immense growth. The cylinder seal and writing development both solved the problem around 3400 BC. 
there is almost certainly a connection between both inventions, which are crucial to following Inanna's trial. Stamping technology has been around for thousands of years. Originally, stamps were used to decorate textiles, and later, when trade developed and merchants needed larger vessels to store oil or grain supplies, potters began using stamps to mark ownership. Before baking the clay in the oven, the stamps were pressed into the damp clay, proving ownership. Eventually, the cylinder seal took over from the stamp seal, which consisted of a roller with an engraved drawing, usually with a diameter of 1.5 cm and a length of 2.5 cm. A king's seal was made from lapis lazuli with a golden cap on either end, and they were typically made from baked clay, wood or stone. To wear the seal around the neck or attach it to clothes, seal cutters pierced the cylinder seals lengthwise and pulled a cord through the hole. An engraver rolled his seal over a lump of clay and stuck it on a piece of cloth, leather or reed mat covering a vessel or chest. The imprint was made across the entire surface if you rolled the cylinder seal over moist clay. After the clay was dried in the sun or baked, the imprint could not be changed, which made sealing a reliable way to document commodities' origins. To open the vessel, the receiver had to break the seal and store the records in an archive. This method was also used to seal the doors of storehouses. It has proven to be an invaluable source of information for scientists to use stamps and cylinder seals. At the end of the fourth millennium, we see human figures working or performing religious activities on the earliest seals. Economic life was dominated by agriculture. This information can be gleaned from seals depicting cattle, sheep and cows in a meadow behind fences and a farmer milking cows. A person is sitting behind a reclining cow on one of these seals. Several haystacks can be seen in the foreground. On an encrusted frieze, two farmers churn milk. There was great importance attached to their seals, which they always carried with them. They often buried precious stone seals with them, which they valued. Sometimes the new owner erased the original inscription and replaced it with his own or ordered the seal cutter to add new images to these precious seals. With time, as the owner used the seals to sign contracts and letters, they acquired a more personal character. Drawing on rocks, trees or other materials has always been a way for humanity to express itself, but this activity is somewhat limited. Without words, we cannot explain the meaning of pictures on rocks or stamp seals. All of this changed radically when writing was invented. For the first time in history, people in Uruk used signs that did not refer to concrete objects, but words in a spoken language. This was a revolutionary change. With the invention of the script, new opportunities became possible. Although both methods are entirely different, it is commonly assumed that the script was developed from the counting system. In ancient times, people counted objects and animals using tokens instead of abstract numbers. The shepherd set a pebble aside for each sheep. Every sheep that had entered the sheep pen was marked with a pebble that he threw on a heap as he herded them to the fold. If he was left with pebbles after he had gathered all the sheep, he knew he had lost some sheep. The tokens were used for over 8,000 years, as archaeologists have found them on many sites. Further development of this system took place in Mesopotamia. The sheep owner gave a bulla to the shepherd going out with his flock, in which tokens were locked, representing the number of sheep the shepherd was supposed to bring back. Using a cylinder seal, the shepherd could be sure not to open the bulla to steal tokens. With the help of the pebbles, he counted the sheep when he returned. Abstract numbers had no tokens but commodities had unique tokens. A cross was engraved on sheep discs, an egg-shaped pebble represented oil jars, and cones represented grain jars, so seven notched pebbles represented seven bottles of olive oil. 
To prevent forgetting how many tokens were inside the bula once they had been enclosed, the tokens were pressed on the surface of the clay ball before they were sealed. A glance at the bula's exterior revealed the number of tokens. When they realized they didn't need these bulle, they found a more effective way to operate. If you pressed imprints on a flat clay tablet, you could see how many objects there were. Clay balls were unnecessary for wrapping them up. With Uruk's economy growing, a more complex transaction registration system was needed. The tokens could record the number of sheep, goats, and oil jars stored, but not their ownership or who received them. Using a little icon representing the temple's name behind the numbers, the temple officer could make clear that the jars belonged to that temple. Nevertheless, how could he register that he had dispatched the goods rather than received them? These transactions were written down little by the administrators. Rather than referring to concrete objects, these signs referred to the spoken language. Despite its piecemeal development, this invention became one of the most critical events in human history. Having learned to read a language for the first time, scholars gradually understood much more of what ancient writers were trying to convey. Sumerian is the oldest language scholars have been able to decipher. A tablet registering a list of various commodities is an example of this script. On the reverse side, the total is 29, followed by a sign. This sign appears in later Sumerian texts for the word bar. The original object was a sea snail poking out of its shell, called bar in Sumerian. Bar also meant to pay, so the sign referred to both an actual object in the concrete world and an abstract word in Sumerian. In this way, the tablet writers referred to something they could not draw with the snail sign. Because some words had multiple meanings, the script functioned as a rebus. It is like drawing a date, a concrete picture of this juicy fruit, to convey the abstract verb to date, or drawing a leaf when we intend to write to leave. In the same way, they drew, for example, the sign Gi, which depicts a red tuft, used in the early tablets to convey the word income, and pronounced Gi in Sumerian. The tablet writers continued to use old drawings and the signs of the spoken language for centuries. Accordingly, they never wrote the word Diner, God, in total syllables. Instead, they almost always used an image of the god An. In the soft clay of the tablet, the Dub Sa engraved the signs. He engraved the signs in a lump of wet clay using a reed stylus in his other hand. Over time, the signs gradually acquired angular forms because drawing complicated curving lines with a stylus was inconvenient. With time, tablet writers adopted more clear signs using their reed stylus. A script was invented by Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata. We call it cuneiform script because the imprints resemble a wedge. In the third millennium, the script changed from top to bottom, left to right, and the single cuneiform signs tilted left by a quarter turn. As a result, the tablet writer was no longer drawing, but pressing the end of his reed stylus into the clay, creating unrecognizable abstract images. As a result of the nails that the rulers hammered into the ground to mark boundaries, the Sumerians named the single signs of their script nails. An encounter between Enmerkar of Uruk and the ruler of the neighboring and equally legendary city of Arata explains the script's invention. A messenger constantly traveled between them, communicating with them about the favors they were receiving from the goddess Inanna. Messengers traveling to Arata darted through the mountains as swiftly as carp swam, and reached Arata like pelicans above the hills. Enmerkar gave the messenger an instruction to convey to the Lord of Arata, which was obviously too complicated for him to memorize. Throughout his speech, he covered a wide range of topics. In the past, clay was not used for writing messages. On that day, and under that sun, it was indeed so. 
Due to his heavy mouth, the messenger was unable to repeat it. As the messenger's mouth was tired, he could not repeat the message, so the Lord of Kulaba pressed some clay on a tablet and wrote it on it. The message was inscribed like a tablet by the Lord of Kulaba. Just like that it happened. Thus it came to pass. Harata's Lord received the tablet from the servant. Despite the strange signs on the clay tablet, the Lord of Arata was dumbfounded. Previously, he hadn't seen anything like this. Staring at the tablet as he would, he was unable to decipher the message Enmeka had to convey. After speaking these words, the messenger handed the kiln-fired tablet to the Lord of Arata. A look was given to the tablet by the Lord of Arata. An angry brow accompanied the transmitted message of nails. A kiln-fired tablet adorned the Lord of Arata's desk. Since the Lord of Arata could not read and saw only some strange nails, he could not understand Enmerkar's message. As a result, Enmerkar defeated the Lord of Arata by inventing the cuneiform script. Cuneiform is the English term for the Sumerian script because of the shape of its signs. In Sumerian, kak means a picket hammered into the ground by a city ruler to secure a city's foundation or construct a temple. Nails were also nailed into walls to confirm agreements by Sumerians. Sumerians were reminded of these pickets by the little signs in the cuneiform script. The cuneiform script took a long time to decipher because scholars needed the key to reading the strange symbols. In 1799, French soldiers discovered the famous stone of Rosetta in the Egyptian town of Rosetta, giving Egyptologists access to its contents. In 1822, linguists could decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics thanks to a carved text on this stone in Old Egyptian and Greek. The cuneiform script, however, had yet to be deciphered at that time. In the 18th and 19th centuries, explorers wandered around the Middle East and made copies of the strange signs they saw on stilles, which they brought back to Europe. The mysterious texts had sparked their interest. These copies helped decipher the Old Persian language in 1846. As a living language and dialect of Persian, this language was the easiest to study. There were only 38 signs in the cuneiform script, so it was relatively easy to learn. The British Army officer and globetrotter Sir Henry Creswick Rawlinson, 1810-1895, copied the signs high up on the cliff during the 19th century. Upon reaching the highest point of the inscription, he used ladders to steady himself against the rock with his left arm while holding the notebook with his left hand, and using the pencil with his right hand. The text was then discovered to have been written in three languages, one of which had been recently deciphered as Old Persian. Using this key, they could decipher the other two cuneiform texts on the cliff. Darius, 550-486 BC, had ordered the texts to be chiseled into the rock after he was crowned in 522 BC. After defeating Gaumata Badia, Darius recounts how he came to be king. In Darius's opinion, this person passed himself off as the legal son of Cyrus, and Darius regarded these events as vital that he chiseled them into the cliff in Old Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian. These three languages were in use at that time. Regardless of whether everyone could read these accounts, the facts were now known to all his people. The cliff was almost inaccessible because almost nobody could read or write. However, in ancient times, merely writing something down conferred a mystical significance, conferring an almost mystical power on the words. Due to their ability to read Old Persian, linguists also interpreted Darius's inscription in Elamite. However, Akkadian cuneiform provided the following problems. Compared to the other two, he is much older. The Sumerian script is the source of this script. 
A translator's competition held by the Royal Asiatic Society in London in 1857 led to the official deciphering of Akkadian. Four outstanding Semitic scholars delivered a translation of the same Assyrian inscription in a closed envelope. The autonomous translations were compared by an impartial committee, which concluded that they were substantially identical, and thus the Akkadian had been deciphered. The cuneiform script had yet to reveal all the languages that once existed. Scholars discovered many words in the Akkadian texts that came from a completely different language, later discovered to be Sumerian and not cryptography. Mesopotamia was home to both Sumerians and Akkadians in the 3rd millennium BC. In the ancient Middle East, Akkadian was the lingua franca of kings for over 2,000 years. Scholars have called the Eastern Semitic language Akkadian after Sargon of Akkad, 2350-2193 BC, an Akkadian language after the Semitic nomads who penetrated the plain from the north. Sargon of Akkad had conquered the whole Sumerian country by the middle of the third millennium and had adopted many Sumerian practices. In the same way, European monks continued to use Latin until relatively recently. They used the Sumerian cuneiform script and wrote in the Sumerian language. As a result, Sumerians gradually disappeared during the second millennium, a language nobody used in daily life. In the future, only Akkadian will be used by tablet writers.